Father God, I ask that you would anoint these words. God, that you would speak through me, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see all that you have for us today. And I pray that your will be accomplished in every aspect of this service, in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of months ago, during one of my prayer times, I heard this simple phrase, sing what you want to see. And at the time, I wasn't singing, I was actually praying, so I went over to my piano and I began to think about what I had heard Holy Spirit say to me. What is it that I want to see? And then I also had the thought, why was he telling me to sing it? I was already praying about things I wanted to happen, so why was God telling me to sing it? We see in scripture that God is passionate about singing. God's heart for setting words to melodies is evident from just a quick look at the Psalms. Psalm 96, one through two says, "'O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, "'sing to the Lord all the earth, "'sing to the Lord, bless his name, "'tell of his salvation from day to day.'" Psalm 47, six, "'Sing praises to God, sing praises, "'sing praises to our King, sing praises.'" In just four verses, we are commanded to sing seven times. All told, the Bible contains over 400 references to singing and 50 direct commands to sing. The longest book of the Bible, the Psalms, is a book of songs. And in the New Testament, we're commanded not once but twice to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another when we meet. And we can see that in Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. So why does God so often tell us not simply to praise him, but to sing his praises when we meet? Song is a powerful component of worship throughout the Bible and throughout the history of the church. Even in our society, songs reflect everything. Both lyrics and the style of the music combine to give voice to all kinds of emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, love, and the list goes on. And it's the same in the scriptures. There are songs of lament, as well as songs of joy, songs of hope, as well as songs of despair. Music and song have a powerful effect on the human soul. 1 Samuel 16.23 says, and whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. For each of us, it may be a different style of music that touches our souls, that relieves our agitation or inspires our heart. For some, it may be classical music. For others, it may be gospel music or any other genre in between. We also know that God sings over his children. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Just like a parent seeking to quiet an anxious child may sing a lullaby to give them rest, God sings over us. And while we know that worship doesn't just mean singing, there is something powerful about worship and songs. King David was the great leader of corporate worship in 1 Chronicles 15. He gathered a large, organized, and skilled worship team. He had musicians, singers, skilled song leaders, choirs. And David taught the nation that they must come to God's presence with an offering of worship. Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5, say, On your feet now, applaud God, bring a gift of laughter, Sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. He made us, we didn't make him. We are his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. Worship is not just a warm up for the preacher. Music and song in church is not just a lovely background while we talk. It is how we welcome the Lord. It is how we focus on his presence and surrender to him. The power of song echoes throughout the scriptures. In amazing moments, men and women lifted a song 
when they could have lifted a cry or a scream. They sang in their dark, in their challenging moments. In Psalm 137, one through six, the people of Israel had lost their joy. They were captives in Babylon, they were refugees by force, and they were slaves of cruel masters. And then the Babylonians taunted them, beginning in verse one. Alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks. We cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song. Oh, how could we ever sing God's song in this wasteland? The people of Israel had set their harps down. They were no longer singing. There are people watching our witness today. They are watching those who profess to love God. They see us get sick. They see us lose our jobs. They see us experience opposition. And the way we respond to suffering and disappointment preaches a more powerful message than just about anything I can think of. And I'm going to stop right here and share something that I hadn't planned on sharing this morning. Our daughter Lily is actually in the ER right now with my husband Mark. And I'm not going to get emotional, but um, this is unrelated to her heart issues. This is something completely different. Um, most of you know that she deals with other things as well. So that is where they are right now, and I am here. And I am here not just saying these words, I am here literally living the words that I am about to share with you today. I do not know any other way to respond but to get myself into God's presence and to get his perspective on the situation. And so that is what I am going to share with you today. And beginning in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18, though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my savior God. Counting on God's rule to prevail, I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. And then you know how at the bottom of some Bible verses they write notes that go along with it. And the notes at the bottom of this say, for congregational use with a full orchestra. So in other words, sing this loud and with lots of instruments. These verses are saying, even when things don't look good, in fact, things are looking pretty bad, I'm singing joyful praises to God. A song can release divine power and potential. So the first thing I want to share today is that worship brings a response from God. Second Chronicles 5, 13 through 14 says, the choir and trumpets made one voice of praise and thanks to God. Orchestra and choir in perfect harmony, singing and playing praise to God. Yes, God is good. His loyal love goes on forever. Then a billowing cloud filled the temple of God. The priests couldn't even carry out their duties because of the cloud, the glory of God, that filled the temple of God. A song of unity brought the presence of God into the temple that had never been seen before. It was God's response to their song. Number two, worship moves the heart of God. A song at first sung in pain or disappointment, confusion or guilt, can open a doorway to the very place where we can be healed and renewed. Isaiah 54, one says, sing, barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song. You who've never experienced childbirth, you're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Do you need a fresh visitation of God on your life? Then sing again. Lift up your song. Number three, worship silences the enemy. Second Chronicles 20, 22 says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord 
for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. As they sang praises, the Lord ambushed and silenced the enemy. Number four, worship shouts God's power over the enemy's taunts. Psalm 8-2 says, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Do you need triumph in a battle you've been losing? Sing again, lift up your song. Number five, worship brings release. Acts 16, 25 and 26 say, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Worship in the dark can open up doors of light and hope. Isaiah 61, 3, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Are you looking for a way out of prison, out of hopelessness? Then sing again, lift up your song. The Israelites in Babylon had hung their harps on the trees. They had stopped singing. Have you? The question isn't, do you have a voice? The question is, do you have a song? If you've turned from your sins and you're forgiven and reconciled to God, then you do have a song. It's a song of the redeemed, of those who have been rescued through the cross of Jesus Christ and are now called his friends. In the book of Revelation, the hosts of heaven aren't in unity because of the style of music they are singing. They are in unity because of the focus of their song. We read about it in Revelation 5.10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What kind of music do people from every tribe and language and nation and tongue sing? I don't know, God didn't tell us. I can't tell you how many times I have read a psalm and thought, man, I wish I knew how David sang that. I wish I knew what the melody was. But instead, God told us what our focus of our song should be, and that is, worthy is the lamb who was slain. The lamb must always be central to our corporate singing because Jesus is the one who made it possible. When I choose the worship sets for our gatherings, I always prayerfully do so. Yes, we can sing songs that reflect on us, that tell of what he's done, but the ultimate goal by the end, by the time we're really pressing in and we're engaging in worship, we're not to be focused on us, but we're to be completely focused on him. Our song is joined with his song, his glorious, perfect song of praise, and that's the kind of worship that breaks chains. From Paul and Silas's jail cell to church services that we have today, Worship has the power to break strongholds in our lives. Just like when David played music for Saul, it causes the spiritual darkness in our lives to flee. Christians, those who believe in God, are the sort of people who can sing at midnight. Job 35.10 tells us that God gives us songs in the night. When Paul and Silas lay in prison, beaten and chained, their fellow prisoners heard them singing in their cell in the dark of night. Matthew 26, 30 tells us that when Jesus awaited his betrayal, he led his disciples in a hymn. And when David walked through the time of God's seeming silence, he also sent songs into the darkness. Psalm 42, 8 says, at night his song is with me. Like Jesus, Paul, and Silas, the psalmist breaks the silence of the night with a song. A song that likely contained many of the ideas we find in Psalms 42 and 43. But my question is why? When faced with darkness and doubt, 
Why did the psalmist sing? And why should we? I think Psalms 42 and 43 give at least a few reasons as to why. Number one, songs turn misery into prayer. Our darkest nights can make a prayer sometimes feel like a foreign language. We can try to pray, but we're unable to think of the words. We start, we stop, we sigh, and we ultimately end up giving up. Or if we do pray, we might ramble from one unformed thought to another. In his own trouble, the psalmist put his prayers on the wings of a melody. Psalm 42, 9 and 43, 1 and 3 say, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. David knew that a song could take his groans and send them to God. He knew that a song could gather up the chaos within and give it an intelligible voice. And so he placed his pain in the structure of a lament. When you are so troubled that you cannot speak to God, you may still be able to sing. You may still be able to take up one of the songs of the saints, whether it's an actual psalm or a hymn, or a more modern song that will turn your misery into prayer. I can tell you exactly what I did this morning when I knew what was happening with Lily. I turned on my worship playlist, I selected all the songs that had anything to do with healing or about God walking through us through hard times, and I played them loud, and I sang along, and I prayed and worshiped to them. Songs can help us when we can't think of the words to say, so we can get into his presence and get his perspective. Number two, songs confront the logic of despair. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preaching on Psalm 42, famously said, have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? David sang to himself. When we read, hope in God, for I shall again praise him in Psalm 42, 5, David is singing those words. He turns to his depressed self, takes him by the shoulders, and serenades him with hope. I serenaded my soul this morning with worship. Often sung words fit where said words cannot. And I found this quote as I was studying and I love it. It says, melodies slip under the doorways of our doubts while said words stand outside knocking. Sometimes there is a song, there is a melody that can seep into our souls where words cannot. Often sung, or once sung, the words often stay with us. They echo through our minds and through our hearts, and we sometimes run that same song over and over in our heads. But it brings beauty and truth to the logic of our despair. God gave us a book of songs for a reason. Often we need to do more than speak the truth to ourselves. We need to sing it. If we think about the song Amazing Grace, I can say the words to Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And those are powerful words. But if I sing them, they are much more powerful because I'm stretching out the words and I'm reflecting on them. So if instead of reciting them, I sing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound takes on a totally different feel than if you're just reciting them. There is power in a song. When we sing into the darkness, we confess that God alone can raise our cast down souls. We confess that God alone can lead us back home and that God alone can retune our songs of misery into songs of praise. When we raise our song in the night, we declare against our feelings that God reigns over this darkness, that God is at work in this darkness, and that God is still worthy of our worship even in the darkness. And when we do, we glorify the God who hears. Number four, songs prepare the way for joy. Songs are not magic, and just because you put on a worship song doesn't mean that you're immediately going to feel better. 
But songs are one way that we can prepare for joy's return. Psalm 42 and 43 end with David still in the darkness. For the third time, he addresses himself with these words. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. I want you to notice here that even though David was still in turmoil, joy's delay did not close David's mouth. He sits there at the bottom of his pit and he keeps on singing. He keeps on praying to God and preaching to himself through song. And he keeps on trusting that as he does so, God will slowly lift him from the pit and joy will return. Psalm 43, 4 says, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God my God. When the time is right, God will answer. And our songs will be one way that he lifts up the valleys, makes low the hills, and prepares the way for joy's return. Worship music is deeply beneficial to the worshiper because it aligns us with the Holy Spirit and the heart of God, setting us free. Worship exalts God. Scripture tells us that God inhabits the praises of his people. When we worship, he meets with us and we experience his goodness. But our feelings should not be our pursuit. We should seek first to call God what he is. He is holy, he is worthy, and set our gaze upon him. By definition, worship is ascribing worth to something or someone. But true worship is also a matter of the heart. It must be felt. It can't be ritualistic. It can't be just an external going through the motions. True worship is a heartfelt expression of love, adoration, admiration, fascination, wonder, even celebration. It's something that happens in your heart and soul when you begin to praise God for who he is and thank him for what he has done. So that's a brief look at what worship is. And now I wanna look at what happens when we worship. One of the best ways to illustrate what happens when we worship is to look at the worship experience of one of God's prophets recorded in Isaiah 6 verses one through four. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. The first thing I see here is that worship brings an upward look, a glance at God on his throne in all his glory. It refocuses our view of God. It pulls our affections off of our idols and puts them onto God. It causes us to remember how good he is, how big, how kind, how powerful, how loving, and how holy he is. The second thing I see is that worship brings an inward look. When you continue reading on, Isaiah 6, 5 says, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. When you see God for who he really is, as Isaiah did, you start to see yourself for who you really are. And you start seeing things in your heart and in your life that maybe didn't bother you before. But notice that after Isaiah saw and confessed his sinfulness, he also experienced the mercy, grace, and forgiveness of God. That's what happens when you really worship. But worship doesn't end there. Notice that Isaiah's inward look is followed again by another outward look. Verse eight says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Genuine worship always leads to an outward look, a personal response or action. 
a desire to be obedient to what God has called you to do. Genuine worship isn't just singing songs and getting a really good feeling in your heart. Genuine worship is seeing God for who he really is, his power, his greatness, his holiness, his sovereignty, his love, his compassion, and then giving him what he's worth, the best of your time, your talents, your thoughts, your words, your deeds. True worship is seeing afresh the tremendous worth of God and in response, giving him the best of everything you have. So back to my original statement, what started this whole study was that God told me to sing what I want to see. And I began reading Ray Hughes' book, Sound of Heaven, Symphony of Earth. And in it, he teaches about sound. The day God chose to create light is the day music began. Light and sound travel through the same medium of waves, and all the categories and forms of light and sound exist within the same spectrum. So essentially, the first time God said, let there be light, in Genesis 1-3, he was also saying, let there be sound. Everything that God has ever brought forth has come from the sound of his voice. The sound of heaven is called the sound of many waters in Revelation 14.2. It encompasses all the frequencies in the sound spectrum, water, wind, fire, and earth. Water, wind, and fire, and then we are made from the fourth element, the earth. Imagine the first sound Adam ever heard was God breathing the breath of his spirit. We are the only ones made in God's image. We are the ones God gave free will to accept or to reject his sound. We were given a will because we were given a soul, and that means we have a choice to align our sound with the sound of heaven. We know that David was a worshiper. God saw his heart daily as he worshiped him. David's love and worship touched the very heart of God to the point that he was called a man after God's own heart. David was able to impact his generation because he brought God to all arenas of it. As a prophet, he worshiped. As a king, he worshiped. In all aspects of his life, he was a worshiper. Psalm 119, 164 tells us he worshiped God seven times a day. He would take out his harp and spontaneously sing to God. David was a prophet and he wrote and sang lyrics from a Hebrew mindset. When God spoke to prophets of old, they understood that when God said it, it was done. They didn't have to work up their faith or motivate themselves to believe God would do what he said would, he would do, and that is a Hebrew mindset. We typically think with a Greek mindset, which means our thinking generally tries to coordinate and relate things into a system. We try to fit things into what we already know. The Hebrew mind didn't normally think logically. There were no stages of meanings or things they were trying to work into what they knew. They thought with the eye, meaning that their connection to the prophetic was always optical and not logical. David saw one thing and then another, and the connections aren't always obvious to the reader when reading the Psalms. Within one Psalm, the atmosphere and imagery can change many times. And then I read this statement in the book. It says, David simply sang what he saw, and what he saw was what God was saying. And that lit a fire in me when I read it because that was what I felt like God had told me to do. So seeing what you want to see became a prayer for me over the last couple of months. God, give me your perspective. Let me see the way you see so that I can sing it out and decree it. Psalm 23 is very familiar to most of us. If we picture the scene, we can see David sitting on a hillside, strumming his harp, and he begins to sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The images here are a loving shepherd, sheep resting in green pastures, still waters. And then in verse four, the imagery suddenly changes to walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then another sudden change, and we're at an indoor banquet with a table prepared for us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. You can imagine David sitting on the hillside seeing all of these images, a shepherd and his sheep, a fugitive running for his life, yet seeing his safety in God. And it leads him to writing, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The connections in this psalm are optical. They're not logical. It doesn't make sense at first until you realize what David is doing. He is seeing all these different parts of his life and then adding God into the equation. He's getting God's perspective in every aspect of his life. Sing what you want to see. The psalms were sung. There are often notes before each psalm that say things like, to the chief musician, or play this with stringed instruments, or with flutes, or with the harp. We need to see what our Father is doing and hear what he is saying. In Joshua 6, 2 through 5, we read the story of Jericho, but this time that I read it, I really noticed the first word of the verse. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. The Lord told Joshua to see, for I have given Jericho into your hand. They didn't already have Jericho. They weren't seeing the victory yet in the natural. They couldn't physically look out with their eyes and see that. God was giving Joshua his vision, his perspective. He was saying to Joshua, see the way that I see. It was important for Joshua to see as he heard, and when he did, he began mobilizing the people to take down Jericho. The people responded out of obedience to God, resulting from Joshua hearing and seeing what the Lord was saying. When God's people shouted out of obedience, God got involved and shouted too. We win battles by praising. We overcome situations by praising. We get through certain circumstances by praising. We are all called to worship and praise. You don't have to be a singer to sing or a musician to worship. You only have to be a child of God. And there are many battles we win by what comes out of our mouths. There is such power in our praise. I believe that when we sing God's word, we make the enemy shake and tremble with fear. As we sing words of adoration and gratitude, heaven is accessed and an audience in the courts of our Father is granted. The combination of musical instruments and song has the power to alter the very environment that surrounds us. When we sing, God is magnified. His dominion is declared over our situation. So when we choose to praise him in the midst of battles unseen, he fights for us. Isaiah 30, 29 through 32 says, and you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival, your hearts will rejoice as when people playing pipes go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause people to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudburst, thunderstorm, and hail. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria with his rod. He will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing club will be to the music of timbrels and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. There is a lot going on in those verses, but our part in the equation is to open our mouths and sing. And when we do, he comes in. But not just any song will do. God told me to sing what I want to see. And I want to see what he sees. I want his perspective. 
We are to sing in unified joy with all our strength and might as God routes the enemy. As you open the gates of your heart through intentional gratitude and thankfulness for what God has done, you come in contact with all that he is. I think that one of our greatest battlegrounds is in our heads. It's where our eyes, ears, and mouths are positioned. What we pull into our mind creates reactions to sight, speech, and hearing. Shortly after our youngest son, Jaden, had his stroke, I desperately needed to hear from God. I needed his perspective. Jaden was laying in the ICU fighting for his life. We did not know what was going on at the time. We didn't know that he had had a stroke. No one knew, we just knew that he was fighting. I was guided to Psalm 31, and as I read it, I began to be comforted, and I thanked God for his faithfulness. And a friend of mine had messaged me during those first couple of days while Jaden was in the hospital. And she told me that while she was praying for Jaden, she felt impressed to tell me that I had a song of healing in my belly for him and to sing it over him. She said, you have birthed the song to heal your baby. You need to release it. Well, I didn't feel like I had a song in my belly at the moment, and so I went to God's word. And when I read Psalm 31, I knew that that was it, that I needed to sit at the piano and release this song. I began to sing how God sees. I began to sing what I wanted to see in Jaden's life. And I could sing it with power and conviction because it came from God, it came from his very word. I wasn't just singing my wishful thinking. I was singing it as one who sees what God sees and as one who hears what God hears or what God is saying. So I started writing and that's where the song Expect God came from. It comes from Psalm 31, 24, says, you are brave, you are strong, don't give up, expect God. And then I began seeing what God was doing for Jaden. And I wasn't seeing it in the natural at the time. He was still in the ICU fighting for his life. But I got hold of God's perspective. And so the next lyrics I wrote in the song, I wrote as if God was singing to Jaden saying, I hold you in my mighty hand, and I'll never let you down. You are brave, you are strong, expect God. I see your pain, I give you room to heal as I breathe my life in you, hour by hour and day by day, I'm healing you. With great expectation, I come. With my healing oil, I come. With my breath of life, I come. You are in my hands, you are strong. We played this song over and over and over again for Jaden in the hospital. Mark and I would hold the recording to his ear and just let it wash over him day after day. Even when he was unconscious, we just let it go into his ear. Most of you are familiar with his miraculous healing. And after he had been home a couple of weeks, Jaden asked me to sing his song to him. So we went to the piano and we sang it together. And I'm going to play the video as we sang it that night. The video is a little dark and it's hard to see. Um, he still has his feeding tube in, so you can kind of see that on his face. But as I was working on this message for today, I thought of how the video literally shows us singing in the dark, <laughs> in the dark times. But this was the song that God gave me in our night season. You are brave. After we sang this song together, Jaden asked me if I saw him raising his hands while he sang, and I don't know if you could see that or not. And uh, I said, yes, you know, I thought you were just praising God. And he replied, no, I was just waving hi to God and Jesus, telling them how good I'm doing. And uh, <laughs> it was really sweet. And, but then he said, Mom, what would I have done in the hospital if I didn't have a song? Did Jesus sing it every time you did? 
And even now it brings emotion. Um, but that simple question, what would I have done? What would we do if we didn't have a song? What would we do if we didn't worship, if we couldn't praise? Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And the word picture in this verse is full of emotion. God the Father is the one who holds his daughter Jerusalem and sings joyfully in her presence. Just as a loving parent cradles a child and sings out of love, so God's song over his people is born of his great love. After a time of hardship, our loving Lord dries his people's tears, comforts their hearts, and welcomes them to a new world. So yes, I do believe Jesus was singing this song over Jaden, drying his tears and comforting him and us as well. Different seasons require different songs. Jaden's specific song was to expect God. When I went through all of my miscarriages, I was singing songs about God making things beautiful in his time. Our daughter Lily has a song of restoration and healing being sung over her. And I'm not saying that we need to all go out and start trying to write lyrics and melodies, but we do need to know and come in agreement with what is being sung and decreed over us in each season by our Savior King. And all it takes is asking, what song is being sung over you? Like I just stated earlier, I didn't feel like I had a song in my belly to release over Jaden, but I just simply asked, God, what are you saying? What's the song? I need to know. What song can you come in agreement with? Jaden's song was simple but powerful. Don't give up. Expect God. In this most recent happening, when God told me to sing what I want to see, I went to my piano that I go to so often, the one where I was just singing at in the video, and I was thinking about what we're still facing with our daughter, Lily, you know, with her recently discovered heart issues that I've shared about here, along with everything else that she goes through and obviously what she's dealing with even today. We're still believing so many things that will be healed for her. And so I went to the piano and I just, you know, started playing a melody, just very simple. And I started thinking about what it was I wanted to see for her. And I thought about how it just feels like, you know, a big ugly mountain that I want out of my way. And so I just began to sing, you know, I look up and I see no more mountain in front of me. It's been thrown to the sea. He is my victory. And then I began thinking about what the doctors have said. And it always seems like they're coming at you with something else. And I know some of you can relate to that. But I also began to think about what I know that God has said. And so then I started singing out, I don't care what's been said, what the road looks like ahead. I know who holds my world. His word is stronger still. And I sang those same two verses over and over and over again for weeks. It actually has turned into months now at this point. And then one day as I was singing them, just these verses over and over and over again, I started to get a little bit more of his perspective. Like, this is what I wanted to see. I don't want any more mountains. I don't want to hear the words from I want to hear what he's saying. And then as I was singing that, I just began singing out just over and over. He's already won. He's already won. And I just sang that over and over and over again in such a feeling of triumph welled up in me. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6 says, there has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. 
Proverbs 21, 30 and 31 says, nothing clever, nothing conceived, nothing contrived can get the better of God. Do your best, prepare for the worst, then trust God to bring victory. Sometimes the enemy comes at us with everything he has and we think we're not going to survive it. Well, I'm here today to tell you that we will. 1 John 4, 4 says, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. As I was singing, God definitely reminded me that he's already won. We have the victory in him. The giant in front of you is never bigger than the God inside of you. Get his perspective. See the way that he sees. Hear his voice and sing your song. One of the best ways we do that is by magnifying and exalting him. We use a magnifying glass in order to see something better, to see the details. The magnifying glass does not change the actual image, but rather it makes it clearer to us. The thing that you are looking at actually does not change in size. What changes is how you see it. When we magnify God through worship and through praise, we are not changing anything about who God is. What we are doing is taking a closer look at his attributes, who he said he is through the word. God does not change what we magnify him. We are the ones who change how we see him. I'd like to ask the worship team to go ahead and come up. Don't let the enemy try to sneak in a different perspective. Keep your focus on him. When we praise, he steps in and says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. He surrounds us with life-giving promises. Go ahead and stand with me this morning. As we were worshiping today, actually earlier this morning when I was praying over Lily, um, I knew what I would be sharing today. I also knew that I needed God's perspective because in the in the moments, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to be here today. And obviously we don't have another speaker in place, so I was trying to figure out what we would do. And I just said, God, you know, I need your perspective. Do I need to be at the hospital? You know, where do I need to go? And I, I really need your guidance and your direction. And so I just started praying. And I said, I know that you've told me to sing what I want to sing. And I want to know what you see right now. And he simply said to me, I am perfecting her testimony. And he just, that was very simple. And so I quickly looked up the word perfecting. And perfecting means to make something completely free from faults or defects. And that is exactly what we are praying over Lily. But as we were worshiping this morning here corporately, I felt Holy Spirit tell me that there needs to be, a, or there is an anointing for that to be released in this place today, a finishing anointing, a perfecting spirit that some of you may be going through situations, whether it's um, with your family or it, you need healing, but some of you are going through things that need to be perfected, that you need to be set free from, that you need Jesus' anointing to come upon, his oil. And his oil, just like his song, can seep into every part of your life. So I want that, I'm going to pray that over, to, over for you today. And we're going to worship right now. If there was any situation or anything that may have come to your mind while I was sharing this morning, just place it in the hands of Jesus as we praise him, as we magnify him. You can pray during this song, worship during this song. Sing out what you want to see. Ask God for his perspective of your situation.